Welcome to worship with the family of First Baptist Church of Decatur, Georgia, in these days far beyond Decatur, Georgia. We are gathered this morning with each of you in spirit. We are joining our hearts and our minds in prayer and in worship, and we're also coming together on Palm Sunday. That day and our great story leading towards Easter will we remember the community gathered outside of Jerusalem, ready to greet Christ the King, to greet Jesus, waving palm branches and shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna. So this morning on Palm Sunday, we too gather together, waiting the arrival of our Christ, our Savior, shouting out Hosanna and expecting his presence to come here with us. We pray that God will be with all that we say and do in this hour. A reading from Psalm 118, verses 19 through 29. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
friends this morning as we spend a moment with our children, we will be hearing the final section of our book, Make Room. This Lenten season, we have learned how to make time and make space to come close to God and close to Jesus as we journey through Lent and journey closer to the cross. Today is Palm Sunday, the first day in Holy Week, which is the last week that Jesus was alive on this earth. And so as we get ready to celebrate Easter, today we will learn how to make room as our final part of our book. Wherever Jesus went, people wanted to be near him. Some were sick and hoped Jesus could make them better. Some had questions and hoped Jesus could give them answers. Some felt dirty because they had done bad things and they hoped Jesus could make them clean. Some were hungry and wanted food. Some were lonely and wanted company. Some were angry at the unfairness of the world and hoped Jesus could set things right. So many people needed so many things. Sometimes Jesus got very tired but he never turned anyone away. His friends worried about him. They tried to help him rest. They shooed away the children. They tried to send the crowds home. But Jesus said, let them come. Everyone is welcome. The kingdom of God is like a great feast. All kinds of people will come to it from every place and time. Some people did not like the way Jesus made room. Look at him, they said. He chooses the wrong friends. He should know better. He cannot be a good man if he spends time with bad people. But Jesus kept inviting people in. Through what he said and what he did, he sent this message. We can always make the circle bigger. There is room for all around God's table. During Lent, we make room. We try hard to see people the way Jesus saw them. I wonder how we can make room for others. Maybe we can start by smiling and saying hello. I think Jesus would like that. Friends, this week, as we go about our days, I hope you will pay attention to the ways that you can make room for other people. As we get close to Easter Sunday, remember all of the things we have learned this Lenten season about making time, space, and room for anyone who wants to come close to God and close to Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us this holy week to make room for anyone who wants to come close to you. Be with us in all that we do, in all that we say, and all that we are. Amen. Good morning. Would you join me as we pray, please? O oh Lord, we come on this day we call Palm Sunday, remembering that story in which you rode down the hill from Bethany on a borrowed animal. And just as that young colt must have strained to carry your weight, you must have felt the weight of the world on your shoulders. So why did your followers celebrate waving their palm branches? Why do we celebrate today? We strain to carry the stress of a pandemic that continues to restrict and to limit our lives. How long, O oh Lord, how long must we wait? Just as the crowd saw hope in you, may we also see hope, hope that will carry us through these long days. 
Many of us suffer the anxieties of illness and injury. Send to us your comforter in our worry to bless us with your calming peace in our illness and to touch our frail and vulnerable bodies with your healing presence. Our hearts have suffered the grief of loss in recent weeks as loved friends and family have completed their earthly lives and passed from our presence into your eternal presence. Surely, you have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So why do we celebrate this day? We celebrate that you are the one who knows our pain, who has walked this difficult path of sorrow, whose steadfast love and faithfulness endure forever. It is with humble hearts we lift our palm branches and celebrate that by our wounds as well as yours we are healed, and by your eternal grace we can leave with celebration in our hearts. For it is through the one who rides the humble donkey we lift our prayer today. Amen.
When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and will send it back there immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread, spread leafy branches that, had cut in, in, that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. It was called the Michigan Van Program. I was a student at Southern Seminary my first year. I was paying my way through school, and every Friday afternoon, six other friends and I would gather outside of the dorm where we were living, and we would pile into a van, and we would drive eight hours up to Grand Rapids, Michigan, spend the night, and the next day I would spend all Saturday knocking on doors in a little town outside of, of Grand Rapids, Michigan called Lowell, Michigan. In this little bedroom community of Grand Rapids, I would go door to door and I would start out when someone would answer the door by saying, hello, my name is David Jordan of the Woodland Baptist Association affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm going to be starting a Bible study in this neighborhood and hope that it will become a Southern Baptist church someday. Would you like to join me? Door after door, house after house, I would repeat this refrain, and you can imagine the responses that I would get. The first afternoon that I began this endeavor, I went to 10 different houses. The very first house I went to, I'll never forget, young man opened the door. I said my spiel, and his response was, oh no, we're, uh, we're already the members of a, another church in the neighborhood. Now, wanting to be supportive of him and of local pastors and the local church, I simply said, oh, that's great. What's the name of your church? He paused for a moment, turned to his wife and yelled, hey, honey, what's the name of that church that we got married in? There were a variety of responses like that one where people clearly were not involved in a church, but also had no interest in what I was offering this young kid from seminary trying to start a Southern Baptist church in a very Northern state. I also had some graphic reminders of how important the gospel message is and how hard life can be. Of those first 10 homes that I visited that day, starting with that first one where I got the funny response, I also, a few houses later, had a woman say, yes, we need a Bible study. In fact, you can have that Bible study in my home. My husband, you see, well, he's lost his job. He can't keep a job. We're really struggling. It turns out, years later, looking back on that experience and having developed a relationship with that family, I learned that what he had was later to be called PTSD. He was a Vietnam veteran. He was having night terrors every night. He was self-medicating and he was struggling with addiction. And their marriage was in trouble. And their family needed help. And she wanted to be a part of a Bible study. Another home soon after that, a part of those 10 first houses that I visited, there were three little children running around the legs of this kind woman that stood at the door. And she said, I would love to be a part of a Bible study, but I can't. You see, my husband would never 
allow it. We're having real problems. And would, would you please pray for me? Pray for us. Another home, a part of those first 10, a kind, gentle, older man came to the door, invited me in out of the cold, warmed me up, offered me tea, said I'd love to be a part of a Bible study. He said, but I, I can't. You see, I, I, I can't leave my wife. She's having trouble remembering things. And, well, she sometimes doesn't even know who I am. I can't leave her. Would you pray for us in your Bible study? You get the message here that I, as a young seminary student, on my first day in what I guess could be considered the mission field of Lowell, Michigan, got the stark, clear message how hard life can be for all of us at various points. And that ratio incredibly stands as sort of a, a truth teller for the way life really works. On a given Sunday morning, back before the pandemic, and very soon we all know again when we can meet in the sanctuary, for those of us who have the great honor and privilege of being pastors or sitting on the platform in a sanctuary and looking out on your beautiful faces, knowing your incredible lives, but also knowing the deep hurts and this ratio that in my first experience as an attempted pastoral presence for a little community, three out of 10 of the first homes that I visited were in life crisis, struggling, hanging on by their fingernails. And that same ratio, roughly 30% on any given Sunday, when I look out, when we look out from the platform or the choir into our congregation, on a given Sunday, that is about right. Somewhere between 30, maybe 40% of a given church group is struggling with major issues, difficulties with children or aging parents, struggling with a marriage that is really having problems, worried about losing a job or having lost a job or trying to pay a mortgage or test results that have just come back that are questionable or frightening. On a given Sunday, 30 to 40% of us are deeply embedded in the human condition where we are really needing someone to pray for us. We are very much aware how difficult life can be. Our passage for today, sometimes called the triumphal entry, for me really illustrates the power of what Jesus feels entering into the city of Jerusalem. Jesus is clearly reenacting Zechariah chapter 9. It's this passage that we've heard before, but clearly in this rendition Mark gives, but also in Luke, in Matthew, and in John. It is Zechariah that, that, that Jesus really wants to bring to the fore, and the words are as follows. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey. The way these words seem to translate into Mark's rendition, and especially Luke's rendition, Jesus is focused on one part of the passage, the crowd is focused on another part of the passage. It's almost uh, this paradoxical, even counterintuitive relationship between these two phrases. On the one hand, Zechariah's wording is triumphant and victorious. 
two words that clearly convey a sense of great enthusiasm. And the crowd obviously is, is focusing in on that, triumphant and victorious, waving branches. And by the way, it's interesting that each of the Gospels focus on a different aspect of this part. They're all four united in the fact that the crowd is laying down garments on the ground and, and sort of giving almost a red carpet effect of Jesus on this donkey. But this whole branch thing is very interesting because it's in the Gospel of John where we actually hear the phrase, palm branches are being waved. Matthew, it's simply branches are being waved. In Luke, there's no reference whatsoever about anything being waved. And in Mark, what is waved is simply the branches from bushes from the field. The focus, though, is not what's being waved or even the cloaks that are being placed on the ground. The focus is these two graphically different images of Zechariah 9. On the one hand, triumphant and victorious, the crowd focuses on that. Jesus focuses on the second part, humble, riding on a donkey. While this doesn't seem to go together, triumphant and victorious, humble, riding on a donkey, let's see how this works. My description of my own early journey into pastoral ministry and the recognition of the deep hurt often that is a part of these groups we're affiliated with, whether in a sanctuary or in a little neighborhood outside a population center in Michigan. This ratio of people struggling, all of us participating within the human condition where all of us are equally vulnerable to the vagaries of, of disease like in a pandemic or aging or relationships that become more fragile than we sometimes realize. The reality of just life in general, Jesus seems poignantly aware, painfully aware, as he enters into Jerusalem in all four of these Gospels, but especially in the Gospel of Luke. Mark, our Gospel for today, the description is fairly sparse. The way Mark uses wording in this triumphal entry passage is quite circumspect, whereas in Luke, there's some details that offer us a little more insight into perhaps what it is Jesus is really feeling. In the Gospel of Luke, the Pharisees and the scribes, these religious leaders, yell at Jesus and they say, Teacher, tell your people to be quiet. And Jesus responds by saying, I tell you, if they are silent, even the very stones will cry out. Kakraksonte is the word that Luke uses to encapsulate what Jesus responds to these religious leaders. If, if I tell my people to be quiet, the stones themselves will cry out, Kankraksonte. The word has a particular kind of poignancy to it in the sense that it's not just crying out as the crowd is actually doing in triumph and glory and enthusiasm, but in fact, if I tell my people to be quiet, the very stones will weep. In fact, Luke emphasizes this phrase, concroxonte, the stones will cry out in weeping with the very next verse when it says, and as he entered Jerusalem, he looked at the city and he wept. It's as though Jesus sitting on our own platform in the sanctuary, looks out on us as a congregation and sees deep into our pain and deep into our struggling conditions of the unknown, the uncertainty, the hurt, the difficulty, the inner weeping ourselves. And Jesus wept. My mother, many of you know, is a hymn writer and also is a poet. 
And mom recently mentioned struggling with two verses that she remembered learning as a child. Two of the shortest verses in the Bible, two of the probably the most descriptive verses in the Bible with the fewest words. One is, God is love. The other, Jesus wept. She worked with those two images, God is love, Jesus wept. And for me, in a way, it encapsulates this moment of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, looking at the city, looking at the people, looking into their lives and their hearts, and looking at us in our lives and our hearts. Jesus wept. Love that weeps. God is love, and Jesus wept. These are verses that we've kept in our hearts since we were young, verses memorized and sung since they're simple, short, and sweet. They're easy to repeat. But we didn't really see all the meaning there could be in those words profound and deep. Love that weeps. Jesus wept because he knew what his friends were going through, felt their sorrow, loved them so more than they could ever know. It was love that caused his tears, grieving with them, conquering fears, still today in darkest hours, sending rays of light and power. Love eternal, constant, deep. Love that weeps. Now we see God's tears are love. This is what we're speaking of when we teach our kids to say these two verses. Now we pray they will learn what we have found, meaning that is so profound, love that led to Calvary. Crying tears for you and me, grace-filled love, forgiving deep love that weeps down the via dolorosa in jerusalem that day the soldiers tried to clear a narrow street but the crowds pressed in to see the man condemned to die on calvary was bleeding from a beating, there were stripes upon his back, and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head, and he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. On the Via Dolorosa, called the way suffering like a lamb came the messiah christ the king but he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me on the via dolorosa all the way to Calvary The blood that would cleanse the souls of all men made its way to the heart of Jerusalem Out of his love for you and me Down the Via Dolorosa all the way To 
As we close our worship service on this Palm Sunday, we cry with those crowds, Hosanna, O Lord, save us. Come save us, Lord Jesus. And as we enter this holy week, we know that's exactly what he did as he goes to the cross to die for my sins and for your sins. We celebrate Christ this week as we reflect on his passion and on his love for each of us. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing to the only God, our savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty and power and authority before all time and now and forevermore, amen.